Great. Thank you, Tony, indeed. Uh, it's certainly true that I haven't been here before. That's my mistake. It's kind of a beautiful place. Uh, sorry about that. Do we need this light? Oh, that's the projector. Of course we do. <laughs> Now, I didn't expect quite so many people, and the, uh, indeed, the talk that I'm going to give uh, is I'm probably, as Tony said to me, preaching to the choir, but it's not going to stop me from preaching. But let me uh, waste a few minutes at the beginning b by continuing uh, uh, Tony's uh, discussion of things that happened long, long ago, and I have a number of little incidents of travel uh, on the way to here. Uh, that I would discuss with you. So the first one goes back, has to do with, with my thesis exam, which took place in Madison, Wisconsin, because my thesis advisor, Schwinger, uh, had left Harvard uh, for the summer and was, uh, was in Madison. And so we had this committee consisting of Schwinger and a bunch of other people and Frank Yang. So this uh, has to do with Frank Yang. He was on the committee. I started talking about my thesis, which uh, had to do with the unification of weak and electromagnetic forces, but I hadn't really accomplished very much uh, at that time, even though Harvard was willing to get rid of me. We'll come to that in a moment. But so uh, I was explaining why there were, uh, there were two neutrinos, the electron neutrino and the muon neutrino, and they were different from one another. Now, this is 1958, and Schwinger had taught me that there were two kinds of neutrinos. And then Yang pops up and he says, uh, Mr. Glash, that has, statement has no meaning, no experimental consequence for electron neutrinos and muon neutrinos to be different from one another. And I said, well, uh, uh, I'm sorry. I didn't know what to say. And Schwinger got up and explained to Yang that you, you, know, you make beams of one kind of neutrino and you produce what, electrons, blah, 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 that there was a conceivable experiment you could do. And then Yang shut up, and I talked a little bit more, got my degree. <laughs> but wait, that's uh, two years later. Li and Yang write a paper suggesting that it might be a good idea to do an experiment to tell the difference between muon neutrinos and electron neutrinos, giving no credit to Schwinger. That's my Yang story. I checked it out with Yang just 10 years ago, and I explained to him what happened from my point of view, and he said, yes, Shelley, that's exactly right. That's what I did. <laughs> Uh, the next story uh, has to do with the Soviet Union and Copenhagen. You see, I got my degree uh, for not creating an electroweak theory, and <laughs> it didn't work. Uh, I was going to go to Russia. For some reason, I convinced myself that a year in the Soviet Union at the Steklov Institute would be a sensible thing to do. Uh, and I was prepared to go there, but I didn't have my Russian visa, my Soviet visa, so I went to Copenhagen instead. And I befriended the Soviet consul in Copenhagen, invited him to parties. He would bring vodka, and a uh, very nice person. I, I would say, is my visa ready? He would say, visa not ready, soon, soon. And a year and a half later, uh, I, I gave up on him, went to Bern in Switzerland, and asked about my visa, and they said, visa, not coming ever. <laughs> so I ended up spending two years in Copenhagen and CERN. And in the, uh, that was good for me, because I ended up uh, writing that paper that uh, was the, the, uh, earned me a portion of the Nobel Prize. So that was my, another story. Next story. Uh, we come to uh, 1961. Uh, while I was in Copenhagen, I was invited by Murray Gelman to come to Paris because uh, uh, he liked my paper, I guess. And I talked to him and explained what I had done. And uh, he liked it very much. So he invited me to come to Caltech as a postdoc. So the next year, I came to Caltech, where I met Sidney Coleman, who we wrote a lot of interesting papers, I might skip along, uh, because something very exciting happened. Uh, Murray Gelman came out with the Eightfold Way, and uh, that became a fascination of mine and Sydney's for, for a few years. But uh, that paper on the Eightfold Way, which eventually, as some of you might know, became a Caltech synchrotron laboratory report and is often referred to, uh, the Eightfold Way, which is flavor SU3, uh, that 
paper, the original version, was co-authored with Richard Feynman. Feynman and, 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 and Gelman had collaborated, learning group theory quickly. Uh, you know, we, no, but physicists didn't know what SU3 was, so they talked to mathematicians. And the paper had both names. And Feynman, however, decided that it was too crazy an idea. He didn't want to be associated with it. He removed his name from the paper. And nobody knows that except the, <laughs> nobody living knows that except me. <laughs> so you can't check me on that. <laughs> that was 61. I'm going to move through a few more years. Uh, the next year I want to talk about is 1964. And we just, that was the 50, last year was the 50th anniversary of 1964. And what a year that was. I would like to remind some of you of the seven things that happened in that year, each of which was enormously important. Uh, the CBR, cosmic background radiation, was discovered. In the, their paper, Penzias and Wilson, was published in 65, but the experiment was done in 64. The observations were made in 64. Fitch and Cronin, Fitch just passed away just last week, Fitch and Cronin d discovered CP violation in 1964. Nick Samios discovered the omega minus uh, particle, which completed the decimet of uh, fermions with spin 3/2 in 1964, and it was that that made everyone believe in the gelman neyman <coughs> flavor symmetry. Before that, I was making lots of money making bets with people uh, and with, with, about the validity of flavor SU3. And with Samios's discovery, I could collect those bets. Uh, also in 1964, Oscar Greenberg uh, introduced the notion of parastatistics of the, of the quarks, uh, which, by the way, were also introduced in 1964. In February of 1964, Gelman introduced quarks. And a little bit later the same year, Greenberg introduced quark color. Uh, Peter Higgs, who I had just met the year before at a remarkable summer school in, uh, in New Battle Abbey, which is an ancient rat-infested place in which we had a wonderful time drinking Hungarian wine provided by Higgs. Uh, but uh, we were having lots of conversations about the possibility of uh, unification of weak and electromagnetic interactions and gauge theories and all that stuff. And Higgs was not listening to it. He was busy with the distribution of wine uh, to the, uh, the members of the, uh, to the visitors. Uh, had he listened to us and, uh, and then did what he did in 1964, uh, things might have turned out rather differently. Anyway, it was 1964, the Higgs mechanism. Higgs plus five other people uh, introduced the Higgs mechanism. Uh, as I said, quarks were introduced in February of, uh, of uh, 1964. And toward the, end, toward the middle of uh, 1964, Bjorkane and I introduced the fourth quark, the charmed quark. So that was rather a remarkable year. Uh, enough for 1964. Let me turn to 1970 uh, and a story involving Steve Weinberg. Uh, you will know that Steve introduced spontaneous symmetry breaking and made sense of the of electroweak unification back in 1967. Uh, nobody took it very seriously uh, at that time. Uh, certainly nobody took my SU2 cross U1 paper, least of all me, seriously in those days. But then in 1970, nobody took charm very seriously in 1964, until Iliopoulos, Mayani, and me at Harvard uh, got together and realized that this fourth quark could be useful, it could do something, you know, cancellation of strangeness, changing neutral currents, and all that. So we wrote our, our paper, the Jim Mechanism. And we, the three of us, uh, John Eliopoulos, who sounds Greek but is French, uh, Luciano Maiani, who sounds Italian but is San Marinan, and I, who sound American and am, uh, <laughs> went off to MIT where, uh, where Steve was teaching and uh, explained to Steve uh, what we had done about 
uh, charm uh, about you know introducing the charm quark uh, in, into the into the theory where it would actually do something useful, and uh, he said more or less, uh, quoting, "Ho hum, didn't sound interested at all, although it was the gym mechanism that would enable his own theory of leptons to be extended to what is today the electroweak theory." So that was kind of strange. Uh, do I have anything else? Well, 1979 was particular fun, of course, when Steve and I, at that time both at Harvard, uh, discovered that we had uh, won the Nobel Prize together with Abdus Salam. And not only that, Abdus Salam had told Time magazine how proud he was to be the first uh, Muslim to win the Nobel Prize. So we sent him, Steve and I, a telegram. Dear Abdus, we didn't know that Sadat had converted because Sadat was the first Muslim winner of the Nobel Prize. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, so uh, various uh, interesting incidents. How lucky I was that I never got the Soviet visa, because otherwise I would never have won the Nobel Prize. Let me now talk about a parable of the pure and the applied, uh, and uh, use this wicked machine. Now, I don't want to read all this. I mean, we know many politicians and opinion makers insist that governments and universities <coughs> should invest only in research that makes money or is immediately useful. And we know that that's senseless. They're wrong. <laughs> I have a couple quotes like this. Uh, uh, Fundamental physicists would be hard pressed to point to anything useful that was directly dependent on their theorizing. If individuals wish to contemplate the universe, as many of you do, uh, let them do it in their own time at their own expense. It is far more important that we encourage our best brains to solve real problems and leave theology to the religious professionals. That was uh, from uh, The Economist. And of course, had Faraday, Rankin, and Hertz focused on solving the real problems, uh, we would have waited a bit longer for things like electric motors, x-rays, and radios. Uh, well, this is a, a more on the same issue. Uh, again, just recently, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences was uh, writing that virtually every new technological product is trace traceable to a research discovery, often one pursued with no application in mind. We all know that, and so don't even bother reading the rest of this. <laughs> I, no, I, just, I, I wasted a lot of time at the beginning. Uh, today's fundamental, well, I don't know if I speak for everyone here, but they are concerned with exotic phenomena that are not at all useful in themselves. Uh, nonetheless, their work has and continues to make, I think, enormous impacts on our lives. Curiosity-driven searches for fundamental knowledge have always been at least as effective as direct searches for solutions to specific societal problems, uh, whether from the discoveries themselves or from the technology they lead to or from the scientists who hone their skills at the frontier of knowledge frontier and then move off in other directions. Quantum mechanics, for example, was invented by dreamers, dreamers like Bohr and Heisenberg, Schrodinger, Pauli, Dirac. None of those were concerned with applications of quantum mechanics. Uh, but today, quantum mechanics, it has been estimated, underlies about at least a third of the world's economy. So uh, dream on. But our critic does have a point, and consider CERN, which has accomplished a number uh, of things. There's uh, lots of people out there, 10,000 visiting scientists from 113 countries. And what has it done? It's found neutral currents of, the elect of my electroweak theory, of our electroweak theory. It's used neutrinos to confirm the quark hypothesis. It discovered, or Carlo discovered, the W and Z bosons. It counted the number of neutrino species, three. It created the first anti-atoms. Uh, and of course, uh, it found the Higgs boson. And uh, none of this stuff is practical. And I would say totally useless. But, uh, but 
not quite useless. And I, uh, I have some examples of uh, spin-off we all know uh, about the World Wide Web, <coughs> which was developed in 1987 or so at CERN. Uh, and less of you know that, fewer of you know that the uh, heating system at Mehran Airport in Geneva has uh, uh, recently been installed as based on vacuum technology from CERN. And there are other, many other applications. So a little digression, since we're supposed to talk about particle physics. Uh, I'd like to make the point, as if it's needed, uh, that particle physics is an experimental discipline. And so I mentioned that electrons were proposed by an Irishman in 1891, and they were discovered in 1896 by an Englishman. Uh, that photons were pr proposed in 1905, detected, uh, that is to say, as particles in 1926 with the discovery of com observation of Compton scattering. Neutrons proposed in 1920, observed in 1932. Neutrinos proposed wonderfully uh, by Pauli in 1930, discovered in 1956, 26 years later. Pauli was delighted. Uh, 1934, mesons were proposed by Yukawa, detected in 48. Uh, 1960, Ws and Zs were proposed. Uh, 1983, they were detected. 1964, quarks were proposed. 1970s, they were sort of detected as best you can as jets. 1970, the uh, 70s, the standard theory, uh, which is a lousy name for which I'm not responsible, emerged. Uh, 1980s, it was generally acknowledged to be triumphant. And then there's the Higgs boson, uh, discovered in uh, 2012 at CERN, and a, a bittersweet year indeed, because it was the last year in which the United States had an operating uh, accelerator at the high energy frontier. And uh, we have no such machine now and probably never will. Uh, it, so it marked the end of an era, uh, also the beginning of a very challenging era. Uh, the values of basic research, just a few examples. X-rays were discovered in 1894, CAT scanners, one of the consequences. Uh, Antimatter was discovered in 1932. PET scanners used positrons. And nuclear magnetism was discovered in 1950. It led to MRI scanners. So all of the scanning technologies that doctors use uh, evolved from fundamental, uh, rather useless seeming discoveries. Uh, radioactive isotopes, of course, have many applications uh, today. Uh, for example, uh, brachytherapy. Cyclotron uh, has led to particle beam therapy, lasers to my, all kinds of microsurgeries. Uh, the polymerase chain, polymerase chain reaction has, among other things, uh, been used in forensic medicine. Penicillin, an accidental discovery. <laughs> A lot of these discoveries are accidental. I mean, radioactivity was accidental. X-rays was accidental. Uh, penicillin. Of course, it's very useful, and as well as other antibiotics. 1953, the well, of course, Watson and Crick, and uh, it turned out to be rather useful as well. Information technology, same story. Radio waves uh, discovered by Hertz in 1888 led to wireless transmission. Uh, soon thereafter, thanks to people like Marconi. 1947, holography, credit cards. 1947, transistors. The first computer revolution. Uh, integrated circuits led to the second computer revolution. Optical fibers, PK, personal key uh, cryptography, secure data transmission, and the application of number theory to finance. This is an interesting evolution. Uh, the giant magnetoresistive effect discovered accidentally by a Frenchman and a, and a German who shared the Nobel Prize within a few short years uh, led to gigawite, gig, gigabyte uh, memories on hard disks. Very quick uh, evolution. High-T superconductors don't really have many uh, applications yet. I hope they will. Uh, and quantum manipulation, which earned the 2012 Nobel Prize, uh, may someday be relevant to quantum computers. And again, 
as in the past slide, uh, most of these discoveries <coughs> led to Nobel Prizes. A few more. Uh, you can go on indefinitely, but I love the photovoltaic effect discovered in 1839 that uh, lights can make uh, electricity. Uh, and that led to solar panels. The, the person who discovered the photovoltaic effect was the father of uh, Henri Becquerel, who discovered radioactivity, because his father was a scientist as well. Uh, the photoelectric effect, of course, uh, which Einstein explained, uh, led to CCD devices, uh, 1912, X-ray diffraction, uh, made possible the discovery of DNA structure. General relativity leads to or was essential to the development of uh, GPS systems. Uh, matter waves, de Broglie's matter waves, led rather quickly to the electron microscope, nuclear fission to nuclear power. I mean, the American enterprise to make a bomb uh, was not intended to lead to nuclear power, but it did. Uh, carbon dating uh, is relevant now to climate research. CCDs, uh, which we was on the last slide, CCDs made possible digital cameras. Buckyballs, who knows what they will be useful for. Graphene, well, a lot of talk today. It used to be plastics were the future. Now yeah. it's graphene is the future. Uh, perhaps that will be true. Again, most of these led to Nobel Prizes. Now this is a big one. Uh, atom smashers, cyclotrons, accelerators uh, are really quite practical devices, and there, although there are very few of them that are used for particle physics research and forefront uh, basic science, there are some 10,000 operating uh, accelerators in the world today. Uh, they're used for most anything uh, by industry and medicine. Uh, skipping to the next paragraph, uh, we know that electrons moving in circles lose a lot of energy due to synchrotron radiation, and that, although once was a problem, uh, is now a multi multi-billion dollar enterprise. Synchrotron light has many applications to science and medicine and engineering and industry, and there are about 80 of these devices uh, in many different countries, 20 different countries, large, expensive toys, uh, and uh, of course the third generation or fourth generation uh, of these devices are called free electron lasers. and. Uh, uh, they, this keeps going on and uh, involves lots of money and is very, very practical. Started off as a problem, making it more difficult to make electron accelerators. Now, it often takes a long time between a basic discovery, uh, like string theory, and a practical application. It may take forever in the case of string theory. <laughs> But uh, here are some examples. Uh, the, between the, the discovery of the giant magnetoresistive effect uh, to gigabyte hard drives took only three years. From the CCD uh, discovery to digital cameras took six years. From the transistor to the Walkman took seven years. From matter waves to the electron microscope took 10 years. From radio waves to wireless took 11 years. From fission to the first nuclear power nuclear commercial power reactor took 19 years. From general relativity to GPS took 78 years. And from photovoltaics to solar panels took 115 years. And of course, you can explain these delays in various ways. Necessity, we didn't need solar panels until we uh, discovered that carbon dioxide is a bit of a problem. Uh, we didn't, it was the war that led to the development of nuclear power. Uh, and uh, it was missing technology. You couldn't, uh, you couldn't develop GPS until you had satellites and other uh, things like that. So there are different reasons for the different delays. Chance is an important ingredient. I mentioned uh, uh, that uh, so many of the great discoveries that have made our world what it is uh, took place completely by accident. These are just a couple of examples. Uh, in 1856, this 18-year-old uh, uh, English chemist uh, was uh, some, had a German mentor, Hoffman, Van Hoffman, who told him to synthesize quinine from coal tar. Uh, and he tried to do it, but it didn't work. And instead, it made a kind of smelly mess with a 
slight purple tint. And from that slight purple tint, he extracted the first aniline dye, which uh, got to be known as mauve. And mauve was, was worn by the Queen of England and by the Empress of France in the Second Empire, uh, and became very famous. And Henry Perkin became very wealthy. And uh, Mr. his advisor, uh, von Hoffmann, went back to Germany and discovered a bunch of other aniline dyes and began the uh, great German dye industry. 1896, uh, Henri Becquerel, the son of the man who discovered uh, photoelectrics, uh, set out to prove that uh, luminous minerals, his family was very interested in cold light, in luminous stuff, uh, like it's on the watches today. This watches can't be radioactive anymore since the 1920s. Anyway, uh, he, uh, he thought that luminous bodies produce x-rays. X-rays had just been discovered. Uh, and it was plausible that uh, luminous uh, chemicals also emit x-rays. Uh, well, uh, it happened it was because of a, an incident of triple serendipity uh, that he discovered instead radioactivity. He discovered that uh, uh, what he was doing was taking a luminous material and uh, putting it next to a photographic plate wrapped in black paper and exposing it to the sun so that the luminous material would produce its characteristic radiation, including x-rays. And needless to say, the experiment worked, and the, the, the film was developed. Uh, but he tried to repeat the experiment uh, in Paris just before Christmas. And of course, the sun doesn't come out. It's not like Santa Barbara. The sun doesn't come out very often. Uh, in Paris in uh, December. And so he put this thing, uh, prepared experiment, in a dark drawer and waited for the sun to come out. The sun never came out, so he developed the thing, and it was exposed. And he realized that, oh my god, he was completely wrong. He had discovered something unique, wonderful, radioactivity. In 1965, there was a guy uh, working on an anti-ulcer medication and he stumbled upon a, a, an artificial sweetener, which we know as aspartame. Uh, and uh, it's interesting. There are, there are, of course, five different uh, artificial sweeteners commonly used today, at least five. Uh, that, for example, cyclamates and, and uh, what is the usual one? What do you put in your uh, coffee? Sucralose. What? Sucralose. Oh, sucralose is a, that, that's a crazy. That was discovered by accident, too. Uh, but uh, uh, no, the usual one is what's the what do you put in it? The oldest one. Saccharin. Yeah, what? Saccharin. Saccharin. Yeah, thank you. Saccharin, of course, you know, causes cancer in Canada. So saccharin is today <laughs> illegal in Canada because it co so sweet and low, which is sold in Canada, uh, uh, there contains cyclamates, which are legal in Canada. However, cyclamates are illegal in America because they're well known to cause cancer. So, so you got the picture. But all of those things were discovered accidentally. Uh, the last one I'll mention is uh, 1996. Chemists at Pfizer held clinical trials for a new drug to treat angina. Angina, however, it's called hypertension. And the, trail, the trials failed. The drug was useless for that purpose. But half of the patients developed a very strange side effect. <laughs> Happened that they were the men. And that was the uh, discovery of uh, Viagra. Quite accidental. Uh, yeah, there are some accidental drugs. Here's some drugs that were discovered completely by accident. Uh, Librium for the anxious, phenacetin for the arthritic, naftin for athletes, for it, Rogaine for the bald, <laughs> niacin for consumptives. So you can read it yourself. Revia for the drunk, sucralose for the fat, another one of the chlorinated sugars, LSD for the foolish, uh, Haldol for hysterics, prednisone for the inflamed. There's Viagra again. Thalidomide was a disaster when it first came out, but it turns out to be rather useful. Uh, for many other purposes, including leprosy. Uh, Lomatil for the loose, lithium for the manic, thorazine for psychotics, uh, quaaludes for the sleepless, retin-A for wrinkles, 
and Shentex, well, it goes on. I could list a hundred more. Incredible. What about things you do at home? Uh, these are not fundamental discoveries, needless to say. <laughs> but they're accidental, nonetheless. Eh. Post-it notes, super glue, polycarbonate. Very important, my glasses. I have 12 diopter correction in my glasses, but it doesn't, glasses don't look very thick because they're made of this wonderful material. Polyethylene, Teflon, Velcro, Vaseline, microwave ovens, silly putty, Play-Doh, slinkies, lots of toys in here. The rubber erasers. Uh, the discovery of, uh, you don't know it, but back in the old days before rubber was uh, imported from the uh, New World, uh, the only way to erase pencil marks was with bread. And bread was the material that was used as an eraser until some guy used this newly imported rubber and he discovered that, oh my God, and he made a fortune uh, by putting, using, selling erasers, rubber erasers. Corningware, that guy just died who invented Corningware. Scotchgard, Kevlar, Saron wrap, nylon, rayon, Super Bowl, celluloid, cellophane, Sandwiches, potato chips, popsicles, ice cream cones, cornflakes, accidental discoveries, everyone. Incredible. Uh, science is as, uh, very important to notice, an extremely uh, international discipline. It has always been an extremely international discipline. Uh, and those of us who have taught uh, you know, uh, elementary physics to people, tell them about the great discoveries of classical mechanics, uh, always focus on, habitually focus on Copernicus, a Pole, Tycho Brahe, a Dane, Kepler, a German, Galileo, an Italian, and Newton, an Englishman. And those are the, the key points that we usually introduce in a physics for poets type course. All of them white, Christian, European, dead men, but uh, today, uh, of course, things are different and people can contribute independent of nationality, creed, race, or sex. And I give a couple of examples. Uh, CERN has scientists from over 100 countries. The Daya Bay neutrino experiment involves a collaboration between China, America, Russia, and Taiwan. ITER involves the European Union plus six nations. Uh, the International Linear Collider a uh, project which may or may not go anywhere involves 19 nations, the International Space Station, 15 nations, Alpha. The AMS experiment involves 16 nations. And uh, just for completion, here's a, here are the states with contacts uh, with CERN, uh, 113 countries. The red ones are member states. Israel just became a member state uh, quite recently. Uh, and uh, this involves lots and lots of countries, uh, surprising. Not very many uh, Central African countries, but uh, only about five African countries, but a hell of a lot of countries. Uh, in talking about spin-off, I made a remark at the beginning that, that uh, you can start off doing useless physics and evolve into uh, someone who does something very useful. And there are many such examples. I just give a, just a scattering of examples. Uh, we have Alan Cormack, who used to be the chairman of the Tufts Physics Department, and he was a nuclear physicist, mostly. Uh, he, uh, in his spare time, actually, invented the CAT scanner, uh, and uh, that led to a shared Nobel Prize for his contributions to uh, to, to, the, to this device, Nobel Prize in Medicine. Uh, Wally Gilbert, who was a student of Salam and a, a very promising theoretical physicist at, at Harvard, a lousy teacher, I have to say, I, I took his course, but uh, uh, he, bec he switched uh, to molecular biology. He would uh, do lots of useful things in uh, uh, wonderful discoveries in biochemistry, he shared the Nobel Prize in chemistry, uh, and he was one of the founders of uh, and, and the first CEO of a Biogen uh, company. And uh, Biogen is uh, <laughs> now employs my son. He does public relations for Biogen. But uh, he left Biogen uh, while he did, and he is now a uh, rather celebrated art photographer 
Uh, he has studios in Somerville and also, I think, in California. Uh, his photographs are magnificent. He uh, uses Photoshop uh, to the nth degree, producing some uh, wonderful things, some of which I've bought. He's also a philanthropist, and there's the uh, uh, Wally Gilbert building uh, someplace in Harvard that I guess he contributed to. Uh, Paul Ginsparg, uh, I, I, when I was at Harvard, I, uh, Paul Ginsparg was an assistant professor, and we voted uh, on tenure. I was the only person who said yes, so he didn't get tenure. But he went off, and uh, he was the founder of the uh, free online archive for physics and for many other sciences as well. Uh, he would get a MacArthur Prize for creating the uh, archive for changing, in the citation, for changing how physics gets done, which he really did. It was a, a remarkable achievement in a field far removed from uh, the days when he wrote Desperately Seeking Superstrings with me, where we compared, well, we were not nice to superstring theory. <laughs> uh, Leon Lederman, a great experimental physicist, discovery of, of the Oops Leon, which was a false discovery, and the real Upsilon, as well as, together with uh, uh, Steinberger, uh, the discovery of uh, two neutrinos. And uh, he has been very active in science, technology, education, uh, and he has uh, created, among other things, the Illinois Math and Science Academy uh, for teaching, uh, t teaching teachers how to teach uh, math and science. Uh, Andrei Sakharov, my god, a uh, famous theoretical physicist who gave us a, a big hint about why there is a matter-antimatter asymmetry in the universe, a hint we're still trying to exploit fully. Uh, but uh, he uh, also was responsible in large measure for the Soviets signing the nuclear test ban treaty. Uh, and he was a champion of human rights in, uh, in Russia. He wasn't treated very well by the Soviets. Uh, finally, toward the end of his life, he was released, and he was, of course, a Nobel laureate in peace. So these are just uh, a few examples, and there are many, many, many others of uh, physicists. I, in fact, I, one of my best students has uh, spun himself off, too. I'll come to that in a moment. There he is. When I give this talk in China, I always talk about Andy Chichi Yao. Uh, because he was uh, my graduate student at Harvard. He came to Europe with me uh, when I was uh, on sabbatical. Uh, he, he wrote his thesis in 1972. He decided he didn't like physics, or he didn't like me, or something. Uh, so he switched to computer science. He got a second PhD just three years later from Princeton in computer science. And he went off and became a, a, a major contributor, I think, to computer sciences. He, he's won the, uh, uh, the uh, Turing Medal uh, at one point. Uh, he was, uh, he's gone back to China. He now has many positions in China uh, and in Hong Kong as well. So, so that's another spin-off. Now, I've been talking mostly about uh, basic science and how basic science can and does uh, often lead to, to some development, some useful development. But it goes the other way, too, and it has on many occasions gone the other way. So these are just a few examples, uh, some of which are rather familiar. The steam engine uh, was invented and improved by Watt uh, long before it was understood. But uh, trying to understand how steam engines work and how to make them work better uh, really did lead to the science of thermodynamics. Of 19th century inventions, uh, three inventions that were tremendously important by Rumkorff, who was a, a German engineer, did not untrained engineer, who developed the spark coil. In fact, uh, if you've ever seen the spark coil to, to the Model T Ford, uh, it was exactly the device that Rumkorff had, had invented uh, in the 19th century. Uh, Daguerre's discovery of photography and uh, Geisler's discovery of uh, mercury air pumps, which enabled him to seal electrodes within tubes, producing Geisler tubes, uh, that all three were necessary for the discovery of x-rays, which used a Geisler tube, a vacuum pump, a Rumkorff coil, all that stuff. 
uh, and photography, because the first thing that, that uh, was done was, was uh, Rankin produced an x-ray picture of his wife's hand with the wedding band on it. And women went crazy because they realized that men could look at them with x-rays and see through their clothing. Quite a scandal. But of course, quite quickly, it became a very uh, practical device, the use of x-rays. Uh, but also uh, all these other the x-rays, radioactivity, the electron, uh, atomic number, uh, cathode ray tubes, all of these uh, uh, very important and very fundamental developments uh, came about thanks to the work by uh, three characters, none of whom ever went to college. Uh, the antenna, of course, used by Penzias and Wilson uh, to discover the microwave background was uh, built uh, by AT&T for early satellite communication. Uh, and it had been abandoned, more or less, by AT for AT&T's purposes. It was used by Penzias and Wilson uh, to track down some strange signal they were getting. At first, they thought it was, uh, it was uh, caused by pigeons that roosted in their antenna. They cleaned out the antenna. They still got this crazy signal. They thought it was New York City, but it was not correlated to what was going on in New York City. Uh, indeed, uh, they were amazed to discover, to realize that they had discovered the cosmic background radiation. Uh, gamma ray bursts were first detected by the US Air Force uh, satellites looking for illicit Soviet nuclear tests. There, were no, there was no indication of any violation of the test ban treaty. Uh, atmospheric test ban treaty. But uh, there were some signals not coming from the Soviet Union, but coming from space. And they were gamma ray bursts. And they got declassified at some point and became a, a very exciting development in astrophysics. Uh, superconductors enable otherwise important calculations. I mentioned here the four color theorem in pure mathematics. Uh, supercomputers are also used by amateur mathematicians everywhere to discover the next uh, perfect, no the next, what is it called? Uh, yeah, perfect number, because uh, perfect numbers are correlated with Mersenne primes. And uh, there are 41 known Mersenne primes. They get discovered by, by various uh, amateurs or professionals at the rate of once every year or once every two years. We're up to 41 of them. Uh, also, uh, you will remember that the prime pair theorem is almost proven. The conjecture that there are an infinite number of prime pairs, like 15 and uh, 17 and 19, which differ by two. And uh, it's not quite proven yet, but within a decade or so, it will be completely proven, probably, almost certainly, thanks to the use of supercomputers. And that is all I have to say, except for the most important part, which is I hope there's time for you to tear me apart with questions. Yeah, speak loudly, because I'm sort of deaf. Uh, so I, I was in your class uh, many years ago at Harvard. I don't remember your yeah, face. It's, uh, it's all that throw, throw facial hair. At us, if you remember. Throw, well, if you were sleeping. Yeah, and I wasn't sleeping. You throw hair. It was fun to watch. Um, <coughs> I had Coleman as well, so I had the Were we both head. smoking during uh, while we taught? Uh, yeah, you were both uh, quite interesting characters. <laughs> yeah, but that's not a question. No, it's not a question. It's just, just, just an introduction. Um, there have been a number of interesting statements by mostly experimentalists that if they had to apply for funding to do what they ultimately did, uh, the famous statement by Charlie Towns, for example, they never would have been funded to do it. And to what extent do you think that the, the way in which science is done in the United States in particular, the the writing of proposals, which occupies a large portion of scientists' time these days, is counterproductive to science? Well, uh, my experiences 
have been fairly, even way back when I was starting off and you know didn't, had no Nobel Prize, were uh, innocuous in that respect. Uh, when I was at Berkeley, I taught at Berkeley for three and a half years, uh, I had a small Navy contract uh, with a mathematician, Nick Burgoyne, and uh, I think it was $30,000, which is, uh, back in 1960 was equivalent of like $100,000. And I remember the Navy came by, and, uh, and uh, the Navy the ONR people came by and said, hey, hey uh, Mr. Glasser, would you like another zero added to your contract? It was like that. And I said, no. I mean, I don't, that's enough money. I said, trouble enough spending what you give me. So things were kind of different back then. <laughs> uh, then uh, when I was, for many years, I was 35 years at Harvard, and most of that time, we were funded by a single contract, the theorists. Uh, I think of the, I, I can't, I'm not describing the experimenters now, I'm just the theorists. Uh, had a, con a contract with the Air Force Office of whatever. And that was, the proposals were writ written by Roy Glauber, and I never saw anything. He did all the work in writing the, the proposals. It didn't seem, he's a kind of lazy guy, and he didn't spend all that much time writing proposals either. And it was kind of routine. So it's, uh, it got, uh, it's gotten harder now. In fact, uh, I was cut out by the, uh, by, the, by, the, by the NSF, and I was cut down to a, a half month of summer salary uh, in the summer by, uh, by the, uh, so I, I mean, of course I don't do anything anymore, so they don't pay me, but that, that, that's fair enough. I don't do as much as I should. But no, I, I, uh, I've never been bothered by that, and my, my experimental colleagues have never complained in that direction. That hasn't, for some reason, hasn't been a problem. I mean, there are problems enough. There's not enough money, for sure. And we're not, the particle physics establishment is falling apart in this country since we don't have accelerators, and uh, all we can do is work in a, uh, at CERN, but at CERN we have no, no authentic control, I and mean, we're just guests at CERN. So that's a little embarrassing, but uh, that's the way it is now. Other questions? Maybe I could ask one. You, know, you talked about your interaction with Niels Bohr, and you said he was practically incomprehensible. Niels Bohr, I could never tell whether he was speaking English or Danish. <laughs> But I didn't speak Danish, so I. If you, he had his hand in front of his mouth. Uh, he had his pipe. Uh, I mean, it was uh, very difficult to understand him. But it was a lot of fun, and uh, I remember one incident. There were a lot of postdocs around uh, in those at, at the Niels Bohr Institute, maybe. 30 of them from different countries, all kinds of countries, including you know Japan and China and, and Russia, uh, as well as all the European countries. And uh, it was one time where a, a Dutchman showed up. And the, a lot of the small words in Dutch are the same as the small words in Danish. And so he said to Niels Bohr that he had made his way from Denmark to, from, to, from Holland to Denmark uh, by bicycle, and uh, the words he used, uh, uh, well, in, it, my, it meant go by bicycle in Holland, but it, it, it had a very obscene meaning in <laughs> Danish, and, and uh, Niels Bohr said, that is very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so they were, uh, uh, one of the, my colleagues, Nick Burgoyne, uh, also raced automobiles at the uh, Roskilde track, and uh, he had a flat tire, and uh, was physicist. Newspapers were filled with an article about a, a, a Canadian physicist who was uh, won the race with a flat feeling. It was just a, a pun in Danish, and it was all over the newspapers, and Niels Bohr was not happy about his, his boys his going out there and racing cars, especially racing cars with flat tires. But winning made it okay. Uh, we have a question back there, and then a question now. So I'll set up. So your uh, presentation seems like you painted a picture. Can you, can you hear all right? I'll shout louder. Shout louder. Shout louder. Shout louder. Shout louder. So the presentation seems like that science, these scientific discoveries have been a mixture of, like, on one hand, we have no idea if they are going to be useful at all. And 
And on the other hand, a lot of them were by accident. And so in this world of like the modern era of limited funding and limited time, is there any way that we can choose which things we might want to focus on to try to like, lead us to figure out what could be useful in the future? Uh, how do you make your decisions? I don't know. In particle physics, maybe you wait uh, before there's until there's a uh, a big hung, hungry country out there that has lots of money that wants to build a 100 TeV accelerator, like for example China, and uh, they want to win a dozen Nobel prizes with all of the physics that would be done. They want to develop a technological infrastructure that can make possible their development of this machine. I think I I don't think they're dedicated simply to doing physics and winning Nobel Prizes. I think they want to develop uh, industrial capability, which they do not currently have. And they can do that uh, through large projects. Uh, that is also the attitude at CERN. CERN also has the dream, less realistic dream, of building a large accelerator, again, uh, with the uh, not entirely for the sake of learning uh, about the universe we are born to, but hoping to develop uh, industrial capability beyond what they presently have. And they make arguments, I don't know how realistic they are, that the monies that CERN gives to industry to commission various uh, uh, new magnets or uh, other parts of the detectors and things, that uh, that money gets amplified by a factor of six or something like that in terms of uh, the future capability of these companies. Now, whether this is real economics or not, I do not know. But there are arguments like that have been made about economic spin-off from developing new technologies. I don't think there is such a public perception, actually. I think I, I find in giving various talks and in teaching a course, an energy course at, at BU, I, I find that there's the, an attitude, a feeling that the, prob the technological problems associated with global warming and eventual shortages of fossil fuels, just complementary problems, they'll be solved by new technologies that the scientists will can do anything. And there's very much that, that, that yes, there, of course, there's, there's a lot of people who distrust science in all of its forms. There are the people who, who deny global warming. There are the people who refuse to give their children measles shots. Uh, there's, there's a lot of that in this country, a lot more than there is in, say, France and Germany. But, uh, but uh, there's also a lot of hope among more normal people, that, but it's an unreasonable hope that we'll come up with some battery that's five times better than the current battery so we can make cars that, uh, affordable cars, electric cars that can drive more than 40 miles on a, on a charge. The Tesla, of course, I've seen a bunch of Teslas since coming to this town. This, this, this is Tesla town, but, uh, but uh, uh, that, that's a very expensive car. I think it's uh, $100,000 uh, or so if you want a 85 kilowatt hours of uh, electricity stored there, which is Maybe enough. Maybe normal people, but the investment in science from the government has gone down. It has gone down precipitously. It's not. It's sort of not so gone up with inflation over over many many so years. We actually own some of that burden. You think it's our fault? Some, at some level. I can't say it's 100% our fault, but at some level, we ask these questions appropriately. But at the same time, we, we don't seem to figure out why is it that they don't throw money at us. <laughs> I haven't solved that problem. It's really a problem, and it's a problem in Europe as well. There's a catastrophic reduction, especially with economic situation in Europe as it is today. Uh, the salaries at universities are, are precipitously reduced in countries like Italy and Spain, uh, and uh, research funding is hard to come by. It's, it's, uh, it's very bad. Ed Shapiro wants to ask a question. Ed.
they found some evidence that some, say, two and a half thousand years ago, there was uh, what we call something warming. that what we call uh, warming effect in the space. Sorry, I don't quite get what you're saying. Uh, I, I, we, um, something in Col some people in Colorado said that something happened 2,500 years ago. <laughs> I think a global but warming. There was a warming period. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, that yeah, may be true. I don't know. There are people who deny the connection between carbon dioxide emissions and global warming. Yes. Of course, there are such people. My brother-in-law, a brilliant mathematician, is one of them, <laughs> but, uh, but I'm not. Oh, yeah, the question, the more the better. Uh, so, Dr. Blatcher, I'm an undergraduate here at UCSB. Good. <laughs> Good place to be, yes? Yes. You, if you were at uh, BU, uh, the school would be closed. Uh. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm, I'm really inspired by, by your work, and I was wondering um, what decisions or, or what, what fields you chose to follow, some choices early in your career, what do you think contributed to your success? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a question. Uh, it's, a part of it, I think a large, first of all, I, I went to the Bronx High School of Science, and the Bronx High School of Science has eight Nobel laureates. No other school uh, in the world has more than four. So that, that's remarkable. But you might think that the science courses were good, but they were really lousy. I mean, there was a lousy biology course, a lousy chemistry course, a lousy physics course, I took the advanced physics, I, was, I didn't take the advanced physics course because it consisted of taking apart an airplane engine and putting it back together again. Uh, it was really, uh, what was important was the colleagues. I, I had the peers, not colleagues, they're high school kids. Uh, so <laughs> among them was, uh, in my class, was Steve Weinberg. We were very good friends. Uh, Gary Feinberg, who was also a, became a professor at Columbia. Uh, another fellow who's uh, 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 Morton Sternheim, who's a professor at uh, UMass, and uh, we uh, kind of hung out together and uh, pretended to learn. Like one day, uh, I would say to Steve, "Hey, last night I, I learned all about the calculus of variations, and you can do all these things." And he said, "Really?" And so the next day he comes back and he says, I learned quantum mechanics. And, and, <laughs> but of course, that wasn't strictly true, but we were. Uh, I, one example, I went to a, in New York City, all kinds of things were happening. And around 1948 or so, I was in high school, uh, Yukawa won the Nobel Prize for suggesting mesons. And there was a talk, that public talk that I went to. It was open to the public. So there was Yukawa. I didn't understand, his English was not very good, but I, even if it were perfect, I couldn't understand. I was a high school student, didn't understand anything. At the end of the talk, a bunch of people in the front row who were no doubt famous physicists of the time were screaming at Yukawa, and there were the words, I remembered the words, it's a scalar, it's a vector, no, it's a pseudoscalar. What, what the hell are they talking about? And I had no idea. So I was fascinated by, by that sort of stuff. And, being a Jewish immigrant family from New York, I mean, I'm first generation American, uh, there was a fascination with Einstein, and so he was held up as a great hero. So I, I somehow, and chemistry sets were interesting. You could really make things explode with chemistry sets. Today you can mix all the chemicals together and make an omelet and serve it to your sister, and she, she won't even get a stomach ache. I mean, but back then, uh, we, we had some interesting chemicals. And, <laughs> So we, we, okay, you get the picture.
But I didn't talk about making little bombs in, in Wood Hill Park. <laughs> How often like that, how was I overwhelmed? Overwhelmed or defeated by your intention, something? And if so, how do you help to get to get beyond that and keep keeps going? Yeah, how do you keep going as scientists to be defeated? I'm beginning to wonder about that at my age, because <laughs> I may be running out of ideas. Uh, but back when I was a kid, I, I there was always. I like to put it this way. Uh, back in the 60s and 70s uh, and 80s, when I did most of the things that I, I did, uh, there was a lot of low-hanging fruit. And so we just had to reach up and pick the peaches and the grapes off the trees. Uh, and uh, for, give, here's an example. Uh, BJ and I invented the idea of this charmed cork. We gave it its name uh, in 1964. And it doesn't take much to realize that with this fourth cork, you can jiggle the structure of the weak interactions and suppress these strangest changing neutral currents that uh, were there even in a, even in a theory without not a, a not unified theory. Anybody could have done this work. And today, anybody would have done it. There would be 10 papers. But from 1964 to 1970, nobody had the idea that the fourth cork could actually serve the purpose that is implicit in, it, in its name, charm. Charm is a device to avert evil. And the evil that charm averts is strangeness changing neutral currents. But why did it take six years for that fruit to be waiting for Iliopolis, Mayani, and myself to pull it off the tree. Different times. So I guess this is fortunate circumstances for you. I feel like people this day, this, you know, today have the same opportunities here and there. I think theoretical physics has gotten too difficult for me <laughs> today. I don't understand the stuff that David does uh, very well at all. I appreciate it as brilliant, but I. Don't understand it. Yeah, so uh, similar talk like this, uh, would you try to get it to the congressman? Uh, my experience talking to congressmen has been uh, not entirely satisfying, but I have <laughs> I have tried to. The only uh, person who was really responsive uh, was uh, Ted Kennedy when. He was alive and well, but that was a long time ago. I mean, Ted, uh, for various reasons, why he even got came to our house and got drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe on that note. Uh... <laughs>